When Maria Sibylla Marian was born in the middle of the 17th century, women were not supposed to be artists or scientists, but she managed to defy expectations and to thrive in both capacities as she illuminated the process of metamorphosis. Learn more today on Footnoting History. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Sam, and today I will be talking about Maria Sibylla Marion, the late 17th century entomologist. I actually came across Marion when my daughter brought home a children's book about her from the library that just didn't sound quite right to me. Soon, I discovered that I actually had already acquired one of the best scholarly assessments of her life, and it was sitting unopened on my desk. And so it seemed like destiny that I should delve in and learn more about her. I'm glad I did, because Maria Sibylla Marion was an incredibly interesting person who was clearly highly intelligent, highly skilled, and extremely self-motivated. But she seems to be alternatively overlooked or overemphasized. Most histories of the period, even those focusing on the sciences, omit her entirely. But then there are gems like the children's book my daughter brought home. While the book plays beautiful tribute to the art Marion created, it also informs the reader that she faced the ongoing threat of being burned as a witch to single-handedly disprove the theory of abiogenesis, which held that insects generated spontaneously from decaying matter. This idea is actually replicated in a few more scholarly texts, one of which also labels Marion as the first entomologist of the modern period. Neither of these things are true. Entomology was actually an increasingly popular area of study from the 1660s onward, and while there are a few who wrote about spontaneous generation, the theory had already been widely discredited by the time Marion started working. I will argue, nevertheless, that while she was not groundbreaking in the way that some would like to claim, Marion was really a remarkable woman. She broke boundaries and made valuable scientific and artistic contributions to the world her work in no way lessened by the fact that she had some ideological predecessors and pragmatic support. Now, let's take a step back and start at the beginning. Marion was born in Frankfurt am Main in 1647, the daughter of Matthias Marion the Elder and his second wife, Johanna Sibella Heim. At the time of her birth, her father was in his 50s and was well known for his engravings of cityscapes, for publishing scientific books, and for publishing illustrated monographs recording the journeys into the Americas. He also had six children, three boys and three girls by his first wife, and his oldest two sons were already training to take over his shop. Matthias the Elder died in 1650. A short while later, Marion's mother remarried Jacob Morel, a noted still-life painter, engraver, and art dealer who had three children from a previous marriage. I will mention her father and her stepfather because they were important to Marion's future career. You see, generally speaking, women in the 17th century were not encouraged to become artists. That is, unless they happened to come from families of artists. While Marion was not allowed to travel and train for masters in various cities as her father, stepfather, brothers, and eventually husband could do, she was allowed to train beside the apprentices in her stepfather's shop. Indeed, it was Jacob Morel who would teach Marion the skills that she would need to pursue her chosen vocation. She would also be able to fall back on his training to produce artwork for sale and to teach young women when being a naturalist was not enough to pay the bills. Growing up in Frankfurt, Marion would also have received an elementary education, which had already become compulsory for both boys and girls in that city, on top of which Morel's brother could play a significant role in the young Marion's future because he was a silk merchant and it was his silkworms that would be the first insects Marion systematically studied. It's pretty clear that Marion did not face condemnation as a witch for her interest in insects, though the interest was assuredly an unconventional one. Many still-life artists, including her father, often added bugs to their art, and he would have had some in his shop for that reason. Moreover, Marion was known for searching through her friends' yards for interesting specimens, and later, her friends and family from around the world would send her bugs to study. According to her own account, Marion's first extended look into a specific species began with her step-uncle's silkworms when she was 13 years old. This would have been about a year or so after her stepfather left for the Netherlands, leaving his stepdaughter and wife to fend for themselves. It's not clear why Merrill left. 
There is some evidence that he was having financial problems, and he may have been seeking more opportunities to work elsewhere. Or maybe he just wanted to escape from the home where he had recently watched two of his children die in infancy. Upon initiating her studies, Marion was very quick to realize that the conventional method of classifying insects, which had been created by Aristotle and was still being promoted by the English entomologist Thomas Muffet, and which characterized insects based on whether or not they had wings, was deeply problematic. Under this system, caterpillars were seen as fundamentally different creatures than butterflies, which in turn obscured the natural process of metamorphosis whereby caterpillars turned into butterflies, a fact with which Marion was already familiar by the time she entered her teens. This observation, which is now made by every elementary school student, would be one of the most significant of Marion's contributions to the field of entomology. But while making the observations that led to the discovery was a fairly simple process, Bringing her ideas to the scholarly world was a bit more complex. For this story, I need to return again to Marion's personal life. When she was 18, Marion married one of her stepfather's favorite students, the 28-year-old Johann Andreas Graf. The couple stayed in Frankfurt for about five years after their marriage, and it was there that they welcomed their first daughter, Johanna Helena Graf, to the world. Then they moved to Graf's hometown of Nuremberg, where he focused on painting landscapes, leaving his wife to pursue her own interests, which included painting, engraving, embroidering, and teaching young women. While Marianne, or Frau Grafin, as she was called during this phase of her life, acclimated well to her new home, she never abandoned her interest in insects. Her first book, however, which was published by her husband between 1675 and 1680, was not a study of bugs. Rather, it was a Blumenbuch, a fairly standard collection of flowers and floral arrangements without any text aside from the preface to the third volume, where, among other things, Marion thanks her husband for his partnership in the project. Her second work broke with tradition and introduced its author to the world as a naturalist of some note. Appearing in two printed volumes between 1679 and 1683, Ralpen, or Caterpillars, consisted of 100 copper plate illustrations. The approach to the text was novel. Instead of presenting each creature in isolation, as most scientific works of that period tended to do, each illustration was organized around a plant. The various insects that ate that plant or laid their eggs on it were depicted along with any cocoons or chrysalises that they built, and sometimes even the insects that ate them. The art, all of which is absolutely gorgeous, aptly illustrates the process of metamorphosis. But the viewer is not left to infer this information on their own, because on the page facing each illustration are Marion's own observations. The art and text work together to accurately tell the bug's life story and to inform the reader about the ecological impact of the insects Marion studied. In the text, Marion mentions the most notable scholars in her field, demonstrating her familiarity with the work that her contemporaries were doing. But at the same time, her language demonstrates a certain reluctance to present herself as a peer of the university-educated men that dominated the field. Not only does she thank her husband for allowing her to pursue the work, there is also one occasion in which she leaves an unsolved problem to, here I quote, the gentleman scholars, end quote. Her linguistic choices reinforce the idea that she viewed herself as an informal scholar, because instead of using scientific terminology, which she did know, she often used vernacular language, referring, for instance, to butterflies as summer birds. She also consistently incorporated her belief in God into the text and affirmed that she wrote it in order to praise God, though I would note that in this, references to God were common even in the most scholarly scientific work. Although Ralpin was distinctly different from most of the scholarship being published in the 17th century, from a modern perspective, we can observe that Marion's emphasis on direct observation of insects in the field, her practice of illustrating their entire life cycles, and her focus on the interrelationship between insects and the plants can be seen as foreshadowing the modern-day field of ecology. Contemporaries, however, though lavish in the praise of her art and observations, never forgot that Marion was a woman. The same reviewer that likened Marion with Minerva, the Roman goddess of wisdom, also made a point of complimenting her housekeeping skills. It is worth it to note that, unlike her male contemporaries, who could devote their lives to their scientific pursuits, Marion was always responsible for keeping house and raising her two daughters, the younger of whom, Dorothea, was born just one year before the first volume of Raupen was published. 
While Marion was preparing the second volume, she assumed even more domestic burdens triggered by the death of her stepfather. She returned to Frankfurt to help her mother settle Merrell's debts and to divide his estate. Merrell's will divided his estate equally between his wife, Marion's husband, and his own daughter, Sarah's husband. Sarah, however, was not happy to share her inheritance, and Marion would spend the next four years in Frankfurt helping her mother pursue a court case against her stepsister, while Graf, Marion's husband, remained in Nuremberg. In the end, Marion and her mom won the court case, but our protagonist never returned to her husband's side. After wrapping up her stepfather's affairs, Marion took her mother and her two daughters to join her half-brother Casper in the Labadist community in Friesland. It is clear from Raupen that Marion was a woman of faith, but this faith may have been a confused one. Two generations before, her father's family arrived in Frankfurt as Calvinist refugees fleeing persecution. Sometime between then and her birth, they converted to Lutheranism, the dominant faith in that city. But while Marion was baptized a Lutheran, she was married in the Evangelical Lutheran Church, which was becoming increasingly dominant in the religious fervor that gripped the city of Frankfurt. But there were also many within Frankfurt who turned to the teachings of Jean de Labadie, who centered his faith around rejection of corruption. Converts to his faith were invited to join his separate, idyllic community and to help build the new Jerusalem. It's not entirely clear how Marion came to embrace Labadist teachings. Perhaps she heard about it from others of the faith in Frankfurt, or perhaps she was disgusted by the process of having to fight her half-sister for her inheritance. Or maybe it was simply that her favorite brother was there. But we do know that she joined the community as one of about 350 adherents living on lands that had been donated by patrician families. She donated all of her worldly possessions to the community and even wrote to the city of Frankfurt to inform them that all property once held in her name should be given over to her husband. But do you know who was not so happy about this arrangement? You got it. It was Johann Andreas Graf who apparently followed Marion to the community, but because he did not seek to join it was barred from entry. The Labadists allowed Marion to annul her marriage on the grounds that a marriage to one outside of their community was invalid. Meanwhile, on the outside, Graf took the opportunity to divorce Marion on account of the fact that she had abandoned him. He then remarried and had another child with his much younger new wife. At this point, Marion also reverted to using her father's name, which she would consistently use until her death. She never remarried or saw Graf again. We'll never know what happened within that marriage. Perhaps Marion had never been happy. There is a mysterious 10-year gap between her two daughters. Perhaps the time they had spent apart while she was living with her mother in Frankfurt and he remained in Nuremberg had allowed her more freedom and more opportunities to pursue the things she loved. But we do know that even after she joined the Labadists, before her divorce, Marion had written to one of her pupils, a girl named Clara, who came from one of the most prestigious families in Nuremberg, and asked her to give Graf good advice. She also left all of her hard-won property in Frankfurt to Graf. So while Marion clearly did not want to remain married, she probably didn't despise her ex. Marion spent the next six years in the Labadist community with her mother and daughters, but after her mom passed away, she left the community and moved to Amsterdam with her daughters. While it is possible that some portion of the money she had originally donated to the community was returned to her, and she certainly did keep her paintings, her specimens, and her copper plates, Marion was going to have to rebuild her life with very few resources. In Amsterdam, she resumed teaching and selling art. But her status as a divorcee seems to have caused her some difficulty, because she started referring to herself as Graf's widow, even though he was still alive and well in Nuremberg. She also continued her work with caterpillars, and while she was barred from membership in the Royal Academy on account of her gender, she was welcomed into informal circles of naturalists in Amsterdam. At the same time, her elder daughter married another former Labadist and began her own artistic career, but her younger daughter, Dorothea, who was only 13, was still in her mother's care. Over the course of the next eight years, Marion established herself in Amsterdam. Then, in 1699, at the age of 52, she packed up her things and boarded a ship for the Dutch colony of Suriname, along with her 21-year-old daughter, Dorothea. The pair had no funding for the adventure, except that which Marion could raise by selling 255 paintings and the specimens she had collected over the years, and by taking out a huge loan. 
Moreover, they had no connections in that colony. Such a venture, a scientific trip by two women, unescorted by men, was unheard of. While there were women in the colonies, most came as the wives or dependents of male colonists. Others hoped to start their own businesses, but were usually assumed to be whores. Respectable women traveling on their own was certainly an oddity. When they arrived in Suriname, they found a land largely inhabited by indigenous people and enslaved Africans, overseen by perhaps 600 Dutch Protestants, 300 Sephardic Jews, and a handful of Huguenot refugees from France. The colony's primary source of income was sugar production, which relied heavily on labor provided by enslaved persons. Marion would be extremely critical of the monoculture being created by the colony and the ecological impact it had. She was also highly critical of the horrific treatment of enslaved people, but she did not have any objections to the institution of slavery and soon acquired a few slaves of her own, including at least one indigenous man and woman. She would use their labor to cut paths into the jungle, to help her dig up rare plants and to replant her garden. They also provided an essential source of information for her. She reports in her notes that they often brought her interesting specimens and told her about their uses in both indigenous culture and among the imported African population. But while her book acknowledges their help, which was not commonly done by naturalists, she did not thank them by name or even take time to note which tribes they came from. In contrast, she does specifically thank a few plantation owners who had lent her aid during her time abroad. In sharp contrast, Marion made no mention whatsoever of her daughters, in spite of the fact that Dorothea had traveled with her and even made sketches of several of their finds. Marion was extremely careful with her methodology in Suriname. Every specimen was immediately sketched and then later painted on vellum. She also made meticulous notes on the process of metamorphosis and on the types of food preferred by each insect. She packed specimens to be brought home for sale, preserving them by soaking them in brandy and pressing them in order to dry them out. But the trip was not an easy one for Marianne. The heat was oppressive. The insects, though her life study, were overwhelming in the tropics. After two years, Marianne contracted malaria and cut her expedition short to return home. And so, in June 1701, she took her daughter and one of her slaves, a woman indigenous to Suriname, and headed back to Amsterdam. The woman undoubtedly played a significant role in the creation of Marion's next book, but we don't know exactly what her job was or what happened to her after she arrived in Europe. Shortly after they returned, Dorothea got married. Marion, however, continued on with her work. She sent letters to contacts around Europe urging them to buy the specimens she had collected or to pre-order her next book so that she could pay back her loans and buy the copper plates that she needed to actually make the next book. Her work came to fruition in 1705 when she published her greatest work, The Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname, which was simultaneously released in Dutch and Latin. The book had 60 copper plates and could be purchased in black and white or hand-colored for an additional fee. Marion herself was listed as both the author and the publisher, and she worked to help market the books. The book was applauded by her contemporaries as the most beautiful work ever created in America. As she had in Raupen, Marion focused on natural processes, including both metamorphosis and feeding habits. Once again, she broke with other modes of classification by putting different species on the same page if they ate the same foods. Later, when James Pettiver proposed to translate the project into English, he sought to methodize it by breaking it into orderly chapters. But that was a deal-breaker for Marianne, because she worried that forcing an order into the work would divert the reader's attention away from the processes she sought to highlight. The book moves beyond what Marianne had achieved in her previous work. It interacts more thoroughly with other entomologists, even arguing against some of their conclusions. Here we see a woman much more confident in her own intellect and observations. Metamorphosis also lacks any references to God aside from one line in the introduction. It seems that Marianne may have suffered from a crisis of faith because she would also use her old copper plates to produce a second edition of Raupen in 1714 with an updated text from which she stripped all references to religion and God. Metamorphosis would also be more focused on the power and violence of nature than Marianne's previous books. Here, perhaps we see the consequences of the difficulties Marion faced in South America. Marion died before completing her translation of her book on caterpillars into Dutch. Her daughter Dorothea would finish the work on her behalf, 
listing herself as the publisher and also adding her sister's name and observations to the book. Shortly before Marion died, her older daughter and her husband moved to Suriname, where they lived out the rest of their lives. As for Dorothea, after she finished publishing her mom's work, she sold all of her mother's pictures and copper plates and moved to St. Petersburg, where she married a Swiss painter. Marion's work became a favorite of Peter the Great, who popularized it in the Russian Empire and preserved her watercolors alongside the Rembrandts in his personal collection. Her books also remained popular in Western Europe, where new editions of them appeared as late as the 1770s. Linnaeus referred to metamorphosis in his work to create new classification systems for insects, and even named one species of moth Marianella in honor of Maria Sibylla Marion whose work paved the way for entomologists everywhere. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Footnoting History. If you like our podcast and want to keep it going, please visit our website at www.footnotinghistory.com and consider becoming a Patreon supporter or making a one-time donation on Ko-fi. That's it until next time. I hope you tune in again soon.